recording now. And uh, so thanks all for meeting me during the lab time. What, uh, uh, as I mentioned on Monday, all of the, uh, the, the information on the Michelson-Morley experiment was originally going to be just a, uh, oh, yes, Jake, I am talking right now, but obviously you can't hear me. So me saying that is uh, <laughs> useless. Give me, one, just give me one second, see if Jake could figure out his uh, microphone. All right, so on, uh, on Monday, I mentioned that the Michelson-Morley topic was supposed to be done in lab. And originally, you guys were going to uh, build one of these things and see one in front of you. So I'm, I'm hoping we can use today's lecture to kind of, one, review the Michelson-Morley experiment. And I could also hopefully give you some, now that you know a bit more optics, uh, I can give you some uh, background into you know, some of the more details that are going on there and what Michelson and Morley actually had to do. We'll also discuss some history of the experiment and uh, there's a nice local connection. So just as a review of what I'm sure you talked about in modern physics, uh, in the 19th century, in the late 1800s, physicists were convinced, or at least the majority opinion was that light Light was a wave uh, that was predicted by Maxwell and experimentally proven by Heinrich Hertz when he discovered radio waves. Uh, but at the time, the general consensus was that if light was a wave, it must have been a vibration in a medium, meaning a material medium. So like sound is a wave in air. Uh, water waves are obviously waves in water. So the postulation was that there must be some kind of stuff around us that did the waving and transmitted light from one place to another. And as you might remember from your uh, lectures on special relativity, physicists called that the ether. Michelson, Albert Michelson and Morley, whose first name I forget at the moment, <laughs> realized that uh, if this ether existed and we could somehow determine its speed, we should be able to do that by measuring changes in the speed of light, and especially measure changes in the speed of light as the Earth orbited the sun. So uh, they, they realized they could do this with an interferometer like the one we were discussing yesterday with two perpendicular arms, uh, one where one arm was aligned parallel to the Earth's direction of motion through the ether, and one that was perpendicular. So for instance, here's our interferometer from Monday. And here, they of course would have had the mirrors slightly tilted so we could see those spatial fringes, but I'm ignoring that detail for now just to make the diagram clearer. And so they have these two beams. The two beams cause a phase shift between the outgoing beams. And uh, we pick that up at, in our fringe pattern. But one of these arms, we'll say it's the uh, horizontal one on the screen, is along the direction that the Earth is moving through the ether. Using just Galilean relativity, which is what they knew at the time, the velocity of light and the velocity of the Earth moving through the ether, the relative velocity of the ether, would add together on this arm in a different way than they add together on the perpendicular arm. And basically, that should give us a different phase shift. And that phase shift should then be able to tell us effectively what the speed of light is, because we could determine, at least estimate fairly well, the speed of the Earth moving through space. So we could call this arm the uh, parallel arm, or the parallel and anti-parallel propagation. That means the light, the beam of light that's moving along the direction of the Earth's movement through the ether. Uh, this arm we'll call the perpendicular arm. 
how you actually, you know, take your interferometer with, that's built on an optics table and, you know, get this set up so that these directions are correct is an, exp you know, experimental details that are not trivial. And I'll show you a bit about how they did that later on in the lecture. But from here, just to kind of review why we should expect the uh, velocities of light to be different and to give different phase shifts. Along that parallel arm, we would have cases like this, when the light beam is going along with, when the light beam's traveling the same direction as the Earth moving through the ether, using Galilean relativity, the predicted total speed of light should be a bit quicker. So we have the speed of light measured from a rest frame plus the speed of the ether. And when the light hits the mirror and turns around, we'll have this effect, where we have a net overall total distance uh, difference in the speed of light. So here, in this particular experiment, Michelson and Morley didn't actually have different lengths. The two arms were effectively the same length. They were inducing the phase shift not by changing or trying to see a phase shift not due to uh, the arms being a different length, but instead, due to the arms uh, having the same length, but the light having different speeds. Of course, we know that they didn't see anything, and uh, that led to special relativity. But this was the overall theory. For the perpendicular arm, it's not that the uh, speed of the ether did not affect the light speed. Uh, however, uh, the way you add together is different just due to the nature of vectors. So along that perpendicular arm, instead of having just the direct addition, you have this square root formula that comes just from using the tip to tail rule with the vectors. And uh, again, I suspect, I know all of you guys have talked about this at some point in modern physics. So I know this is a bit of a review, review right now, but if you do have any questions or something you forget about the story or the theory, let me know happy to stop and go through as much as I can. So here we're going to use our normal uh, symbol C for the speed of light. And here we're going to pretend we're physicists in the 19th century. So we don't know that the speed of light C is a universal constant yet. So that's just the speed of light is measured from a rest frame. And V is the velocity of the ether. So here, the blue arrow is the direction of the Earth's motion through the ether. So let's find the time just using some basic distance divided by, we could find the time it takes the light to travel down this arm. So we want to find the total time it takes to go forward and back and meet up with the other beam. That time is going to be the time it takes to go down to the mirror then the time it takes to come back. Using our uh, Galilean theory, the speed should be different on each. So these, uh, that's what the difference in this minus and plus sign are. I'm going to do some algebra just to simplify, combine, get common denominators, combine everything and simplify as much as I can. So this time works out to be two times the length of the arm divided by the rest speed of light C. And then we have this factor one over one minus V squared over C squared. That is of course uh, a term that you should be familiar with from your study of relativity. For the perpendicular arm, the speed stays the same the entire time. However, uh, that speed is given by that square root formula that we had on the last slide. So the total distance to go down and back is two times the length of the arm. And here in Michelson Morley's experiment, the length of the arm was the same, of both arms is the same, so we could use L. And the speed is the square root of C squared minus the speed of the ether squared. We could call that the time, the travel time for the perpendicular arm, so T perpendicular. And then kind of factoring out a uh, 
factor C, we could rewrite this using the same uh, constants out front as T parallel, so 2L over C. But here we get a 1 over square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. So notice that's key, that difference is key. So if, the, if this ether postulate is true, then the time it takes for the light to travel down one arm versus the other are different. And they're different because of this square root. So what this means is that when the two light beams meet up, there will be a, fr a phase shift that results in a, the fringes moving uh, by a distance corresponding to that phase. So here the phase shift is going to be, we have to multiply by the frequency of the light wave, but going back to uh, one of the first few, first few weeks of the class, that phase shift is gonna be the frequency of our light wave times whatever the delay time is. And here the delay time from one arm to the other is just the difference between the travel time in the parallel arm minus the travel time in the perpendicular arm. So we could take these two and just kind of measure that phase shift. But however, the problem here is that you kind of need a reference measurement. It's hard to kind of, given the amount of error that is involved in this experiment and the small phase shift, uh, you want to make sure that what you're measuring is really a true phase shift and not, for instance, due to a small, hard to measure difference between the two arms. So in order to kind of get around that fact, Michelson Morley did what's called a reference measurement. So they did this measurement twice, except one time they rotated the whole interferometer by 90 degrees. So what used to be the parallel arm became the perpendicular arm and vice versa. What that allowed them to do is then take both of these measurements so they could measure the delay time for one arm and the other. So they would rotate it like this. T parallel becomes T perpendicular and vice versa. And then what they do is they can then compute the phase shift. They could add these travel times together and the actual phase shift we would see will be comparing these two measurements will be double the phase shift from just one of the measurements. And the reason for doing this is just to can't, by rotating by 90 degrees, it allows you to cancel out for any error in position or distance that might happen in one of the arms. Uh, using an interferometer built today, uh, if you just want to see the net effect for an interferometer, you don't have to do anything like this. But if you want a really exact measurement of, for instance, the speed of light in these two different frames, something like this is important. So let's compute this phase shift. Let's actually try to get a number for it, or get it in terms, at least get it in terms of the geometrical quantities that we can measure. So we'll plug in our formulas for the parallel time and the perpendicular time. So we have this 2L over C factor. And then we have, for the parallel time, one over one minus V squared over C squared for the perpendicular time, one over the square root of that. So now there comes a whole lot of algebra, but what we can do is we're gonna assume that one thing that at least physicists agreed on at the time was that the speed of light, whatever it was, uh, we had measurements not as good as we had today, but we knew it was somewhere up there in like three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So we knew that the speed of light was much faster than the speed of the earth moving through the ether. So we can simplify this calculation a bit by doing some Taylor expansions. So for instance, if V is much less than C, we could expand this fraction as approximately one plus V squared over C squared. For our other fraction with the square root, uh, we can also expand it. The only difference is uh, the power of the square root, the one half, comes down as a multiple here on our second term. So these are Taylor expansions. You've definitely, you've done similar ones in this class and also in classical mechanics. So hopefully 
this kind of makes sense to everyone what we're doing. But what it does is it helps us, it makes the algebra a bit easier and allows us to combine some like terms. So our phase shift reduces to this. Ones cancel out, which is nice. And those two v squared over c squared terms we have leaves us with just a one half v squared over c squared. Cancel out those twos. Uh, and that gives us for our total phase shift becomes this quantity. And we could simplify some more omega divided by c is the wavelength of our light wave. So frequency, angular frequency divided by speed of light gives us the wavelength, so that gives, gets rid of one of those factors of C. So now we'll see here that the phase shift we see should be proportional to the speed of the, the relative speed of the Earth through the ether squared. The total phase shift is gonna of course depend on how long the arms are. So the longer, the bigger you could build this interferometer, the more easy it will be to see the effect because the phase shift will be bigger and we'll see more fringes move. Uh, if we could do this with a uh, shorter wavelength of light, we'll see more fringes shift by because wavelengths in the denominator. So it's really quite straightforward. If you see a fringe shift in this experiment, there must be a relative speed between the earth and the ether. And then that would kind of show us that we have a prediction for the ether. And uh, this experiment, seeing this fringe shift that this experiment has designed would be proof that the ether does indeed exist. Because the earth, this uh, speed, if the ether didn't exist, this V would be zero. There would be no relative speed between the earth and the ether. But of course, as you guys know, the Earth's orbital speed around the sun, I'm sure you have these numbers just like right off the top of your head, is around uh, 30,000 meters per second, give or take. So V divided by C is 0 0.0001, and it gets squared. So this whole quantity here, at least in theory, if the ether exists, it's not big, but it's not zero either. And so fortunately we have like our interferometer is maybe a meter long if we're using kind of, uh, you know, our table and lab or something. So L divided by lambda is quite a big number. So that gives us kind of a larger phase shift. Still the time difference between the two arms is small. So, but we have a large, uh, we have a large frequency for visible light so regardless of which side of this equation you look at, the phase shift comes out to be small, but still measurable, or at least the predicted phase shift. We should see the uh, phases shift by about 0.2 radians. So we're not going to see like a fringe move the whole length of a fringe, we'll see it move some fraction, but small enough that we could still measure it. Uh, but it's still big enough that we can measure. It's small, but big enough that we can measure. And Michelson and Morley played some tricks with their interferometer that allowed them to make this phase shift bigger and bigger. So for one, notice that L here, if you, as I said, if you increase L, the length of the interferometer arms, you can get a bigger and bigger phase shift. So this is small, but if you wanna see your fringes move by a whole half of a wavelength or from for a dark fringe to turn into a bright fringe, what you wanna do is to increase L such that your phase shift becomes pi. So we have a ways to go, but you can do that, or at least you can get close. So what Michelson and Morley did, their whole optical table, their breadboard, which was really at the time a big concrete block with some uh, screw holes uh, bored into it. They had each interferometer arm was not just one pass, but there are multiple mirrors. So like one interferometer arm, here's our beam splitter at this point. And then one beam would go this way back and go across the table five or six times before it bounces all the way back. 
and then eventually is uh, sent out to the light source or to the detector. The same thing would happen on the other arm. So even though they had a limited table size, they used some mirrors to bend the path of the beam such that they had uh, interferometer arms that were effectively many, many meters long. So much uh, bigger than the length of the mirror, than the length of, or the diagonal of the table. They also had the whole giant concrete table on a rotation stage, so they could do this 90 degree reference measurement. So it was not easy, but this allowed them to see a much bigger phase shift and allowed them to get, uh, or hopefully they hope to get a much better, uh, better, more accurate measurement of the speed of the earth through the ether. So this is probably some details that you didn't see in, uh, in modern physics, though maybe you have. Uh, but you'll see the other thing that they have here, they were using, they didn't have lasers at the time, so they used a white light source and they had to use this glass compensator plate that we talked about on Monday. And that's over here. So it's in uh, the arm that, one, the arm that goes through the beam splitter material less will need the glass compensator plate. But you guys can, uh, we were not going to build in lab this version. We were instead going to build one, which is two mirrors. But hopefully from your experience building things in lab, you can have some kind of idea of what goes in to the alignment of this type of structure. It was not an easy experiment by any means. As a photograph of their actual apparatus from the time, you could see it here. So you could see all of the, what we would call in optics, the folding mirrors to bend the beam back to make the path effectively longer. These white blocks here, this is the compensator plate. This is the beam splitter. Over here is the light source with that lens to collimate it. So that lens is kind of used like we use the lens in the uh, beam expander experiment uh, from earlier in the semester. It's used to kind of make a wide uh, kind of column of light that doesn't spread out too much. And then they, they were actually measuring the fringes by eye. So they had a telescope here as their detector, which would magnify the fringe pattern so they'd have an easier time seeing it. So a lot of the stuff that you, uh, it's unfortunate we won't be able to build one, build Michelson interferometers this semester because uh, a lot of the stuff we built earlier in the semester kind of goes into them. Uh, but hopefully you can see how some of the stuff that you've put together plays a role here. their kind of target that they were looking at was something like this, where they would use a photographic film and they would show, uh, and they would get bright and dark fringes on the film and they would compare no turns to uh, the 90 degree turn. And you'll see the fringes end up in the same exact place. So, Every measurement they did, no matter what, showed no changes in the pattern at all. The reason for the, uh, of course, the size of the table, it's much bigger than, much bigger, thicker, and heavier than our optical breadboards. That was to eliminate vibrations that, or to at least lessen vibrations that might move around these fringes. Uh, but as you guys know, the end of this story, uh, they saw no phase shift. Uh, and meaning that the only way they could see absolutely no phase shift was if the relative velocity between the earth and the ether was zero. And we know that's not true because the earth is moving uh, in orbit around the sun. Uh, so the only leftover postulate was that the postulate of the ether existing must not be correct. That the ether must not exist and the speed of light along both of these different arms must be the same. And that of course leads in to the postulates of special relativity and big, uh, you know, the famous uh, results that confirmed Einstein's theory about the nature of space and time. So probably the most famous optics experiment that every physics student talks about multiple times in their classes. Uh, another thing that's kind of cool to point out here is that it is kind of has a local connection in Michelson, who's pictured here. 
Uh, I didn't have time to look up Morley's picture, so he is, you know, totally being forgotten about here. Uh, interesting thing that you may or may not know, though, is, though I suspect that those of you that took modern physics with Tucholsky did hear about this connection, is that uh, Michelson was both a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and he later came back as a professor there. So Michelson was a local guy who taught physics locally in Annapolis. Uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment uh, resulted in him winning the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, the first American to do so. And even though that when he built the interferometer, he had done that after he had left the Naval Academy, he had moved around to a lot of different schools, including uh, Clark University in Massachusetts, uh, University of Chicago, and then one school in Ohio, I think it might have been Case Western, but I have to check on that. But it was when he was in Ohio that he built the uh, interferometer. That being said, the Naval Academy still likes to take credit for uh, Michelson's work. Uh, the map, one of the map and sciences building, one that you can see if you've been to Annapolis, you've probably seen this building, uh, if, if you've ever toured the Naval Academy. Uh, and I believe you can see it from the Severn River Bridge when you're crossing over uh, into Annapolis. That's named Michelson Hall in honor of Albert Michelson. So the lo local connections and history here, as well as a cool history of science. So some other fun, uh, fun things here that you have to con consider. Uh, this was not necessarily, the result of this experiment was not necessarily convincing at the time uh, to other scientists. So, you know, it is quite possible that at a certain point, like if the Earth is over here, uh, give me one second. Sorry about that. My Microsoft auto update wanted to uh, auto update right now. And I don't know if you guys caught that on your screen. Hopefully not, but I got rid of it. So, of course, one of the objections to uh, Michelson-Morley's null result on the experiment was that, oh, well, maybe the Earth was just in a point in its orbit where it was moving along with the same velocity as the ether. So uh, your result proves nothing until, uh, so what they had to do to really make this convincing was to do this experiment at multiple times throughout the year. Once when the Earth was at different points in its orbit, so maybe once here, once over here after the earth moves because if you compare here to here when the earth is at different side of its orbit all of a sudden the earth is now moving against the ether instead of with it so you really in order to make this result convincing you have to do this same interferometer experiment at different times throughout the year and of course michelson and morley did that and uh, that kind of made their experiment much more convincing So of course this led into special and general relativity. Uh, it's in particular, it provided experimental base, an experimental basis to the second postulate of special relativity that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames and there's no particular rest frame for light. There is no ether. So of course we're not going to go into special relativity here uh, but just kind of putting this experiment into context. Another interesting thing where you see applications of the basic Michelson interferometer is in the detection of gravitational waves. So if you guys have followed any of this, uh, the recent science that is, it was only a few years ago that gravitational waves were first shown to exist. And basically what a gravitational wave is, is if you have a really heavy massive object like a neutron star or a black hole and it's disturbed somehow. So for instance, you know, two, two neutron stars collapsing into each other, the presence of that mass warps the space around it, changes the length and width, similar to length contraction in special relativity. And that change, that warping in space in distance uh, changes with time and you could create these ripples in the what you might call the fabric of space. And so gravitational waves will shrink space in one direction, expand it in another. This is what we would call a 
quadrupole radiation, but don't worry about that. It's kind of more like a uh, advanced term that we won't really be coming back to. So, but this is something you should also be able to see with a accurate enough, precise enough Michelson interferometer. Uh, if you could align up one of these arms with the direction that the wave is shrinking space compared to the other, where it's uh, being stretched, you should be able to induce a phase shift in a Michelson interferometer. And by seeing that phase shift and measuring its changes with time, you should be able to measure this gravitational wave. So uh, the only difference here is that in order to get a Michelson interferometer that's accurate enough where the phase shift is measurable, you need to have exceptionally long arms in the interferometer. So the length of your arms no longer has to be like one to 10 meters. We're talking arms that are about four kilometers in length. So they have to be gigantic. So, because really the only kind of difference that we're measuring here is a change in about the width of a nucleus. So these gravitational waves, once they reach us, are very, very weak, which is why they were very hard to measure. So this measurement is very difficult. Not only do you have to have this really, these really long arms, so you get a, so this tiny difference gives you a larger phase shift you also need to have to basically completely eliminate any other sources of noise in the experiment. The mirrors can't vibrate, uh, air currents passing through the laser beams inside the interferometer basically can't be there. So you have to have this four kilometer long interferometer that's all under vacuum where the mirrors have so much vibrational damping uh, that basically no even small vibrations can't take hold. Uh, it's an extremely difficult experiment, but it's one that we've actually done. And we've used it to, uh, first gravitational waves were uh, from two colliding black holes. As a picture, you may have heard of these, uh, this experiment uh, uh, called LIGO, of which there's one at Caltech and one at Hanford. I believe that's in Tennessee. Uh, but it's in the uh, southern United States somewhere, but I believe Tennessee. And basically here you could see the, uh, the facility structure and this long uh, tube extending out, that's one of the interferometer arms. At the end is one of our mirrors. And in the center here in this is where our, our beam splitter and our light source and detector apparatus are, and the other arm goes out this way, uh, horizontal to the screen. Uh, so the whole arm is uh, kind of contained in these tubes that go on for four kilometers, and uh, the mirrors and the whole tube are kept under a giant vacuum. It takes forever to, uh, to pump out all the air, but this is what's required to actually get to eliminate the sources of no other sources of noise that might car cause much larger phase shifts and thus prevent us from seeing the data we expect to see. So uh, LIGO, the gravitational wave experiment, is called that because it stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory. So really it's just a Michelson interferometer, but an exceptionally good one, an exceptionally uh, accurate and precise one. And whether that's something you might have known, might not have known, but uh, the optics experiment is really the basic Michelson-Morley experiment. The theory of general relativity that goes into predicting what that delta L will be is much more complicated, however. So uh, that's really what I wanted to go over today. Uh, these two examples of kind of connecting the Michelson-Morley interferometer uh, to its classical application and also this other app, more recent application. Uh, the two problems, I have two problems on this right now. I might add a third. I'm going to post the slides onto Canvas soon, so you'll have these uh, hopefully this afternoon. Uh, both problems involve measuring a phase shift with a Michelson interferometer. But the second problem discusses a different application, a third application of Michelson interferometers, which is measuring uh, 
small indices of refraction that are very close to one, but not quite. So for instance, the index of refraction of gases. Michelson interferometers can give us a good measurement of that. So the second problem kind of talks you through how you might use a Michelson interferometer to do that measurement. That's also, a, that's, that in particular is the experiment we do with the interferometer in advanced lab. So uh, you might end up doing this experiment in the future. Uh, that being said, uh, that's our lecture for today. And on tomorrow, uh, we'll have our third and last lecture on interferometers and we'll discuss some different types and also different applications for interferometers. So if you have any questions, happy to answer them now. If not, we're done for today. Thank you for joining in on a Tuesday so that we could get this material in.